Have you ever wondered how computers actually talk? Maybe you're someone studying for a computer certification, or someone who just wants to know how things work. In simple, clear and concise English, this tutorial will show you exactly how. In my example, I have two friends. Please say hello to John and Sarah. Now because they live in different time zones, the only real way they can keep in touch is by digital communication. This tutorial will show you the real nuts and bolts of how computer traffic flows. You'll learn how the email leaves John's computer and a few seconds later arrives on Sarah's computer. How is this possible when it used to be weeks or sometimes even months to get information across these distances? Let me introduce you to Open Systems Interconnection Standard, commonly referred to as OSI or the OSI model. So what is this OSI model? Firstly, I'll tell you what it is not. There isn't a button or setting called the OSI. You can't go and make any changes in the settings app or control panel. It's a framework to which companies around the world agree to. What I mean by framework is, let's say I design a new plug. And my plug has three pins. Each of the pins are a specific length and shape. Now all plug companies around the world agree that this is a brilliant plug design and it becomes the industry standard for power plugs. And of course all the companies that make the power sockets change their designs to fit my plug. It doesn't matter what device you attach the plug to, power should flow as intended. We now have a framework for a power plug. So in essence, the OSI model is a standardized architecture which defines network communication. It was developed in 1984 by the International Organization for Standardization, also known as ISO. If you want to find out why the organization's initials are ISO and not IOS, please direct your questions directly to them. The OSI model was designed to allow cross-platform communication meaning Apple, Linux or Windows and possibly others can all talk to each other. They just need to connect to the top layer of the OSI using the relevant application programming interface for their operating system. This is known as the API. So without further delay let's look at the OSI model. The layers are always in this order and counting from the bottom up layer 1 is the physical layer and proceeding up to layer 7 which is the application layer. This is useful when troubleshooting problems. You may hear references to the problem being at layer 8 but we won't go there. A good way of remembering this order is to use a system like this. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. Let's take a look at the application layer. When we say the application layer this is not the application itself. Think of this layer as a socket for the network aware application to plug into. And by saying network aware, I mean something like Firefox, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Outlook, or FileZilla, just to name a few. Applications like Microsoft Notepad do not care about the network, so would not communicate with the application layer. Let's move down to the presentation layer. The presentation layer ensures that passing communications are in the appropriate form. Is the data the correct data format, such as HTML, HTTP? Is the data compatible with the operating system of the host? Is the data payload encapsulated correctly for transmission? Is the data encrypted correctly? Let's open the session layer. A session is a persistent logical thinking of two application processes. The primary job of the session layer is to provide the means necessary to set up, manage and end TCP sessions. Session layer software products are more of a set of tools rather than specific protocols. These session layer tools are normally provided to higher layer protocols through command sets, often called 
application program interfaces or APIs. Common APIs include NetBIOS, TCP IP sockets and remote procedure calls or RPCs. They allow an application to accomplish certain high level communications over the network easily by using a standardized set of services. Now for the real magic to start. Let's open the transport layer. We're going to need a bit more room for this so let's just clear all this out of the way. I'll draw up a simple diagram. Here's my computer and my computer is connected to a switch. The switch is connected to a router. Now for the folks at home your switch and router is probably combined into a single unit provided by your internet service provider. But my router is connected directly to the internet and when it gets to the other end there will be another router. This router will also be connected to a switch. And finally, let's connect this switch to our destination server. This web server is hosting Amazon.com. It is the transport layer which defines how data is sent. For example, here's a packet of data. I'll come on to why it's called a packet later in the video, but for now, just go with me on this. The first question is, do I want to send reliably or unreliably. I know some of you are saying that's pretty obvious of course I want to send it reliably but that's not always the case. Let's match these up to some protocols and you'll see why. Reliably is TCP which is an abbreviation of Transmission Control Protocol and unreliably is UDP which is an abbreviation of User Datagram Protocol. What reliably means is that we're going to do a three-way handshake before we begin our transmission to make sure our data can get there. Our PC is going to send a request to synchronize with the web server. This is called a SYN. The web server will then confirm to say, yes, I got that packet. This is called a SYNAC, which means synchronization acknowledgement. my PC will then send the final handshake back to the web server. This is called an ACK, which is an acknowledgement that our PC can hear the web server loud and clear. Now the three-way handshake is established and the transmission of the data can begin. Remember this three-way handshake happens with every packet which is sent. TCP is great for file transfer or backups. But what about voice over IP or streaming TV? What if there's a blip on the voice call or a corrupt pixel in the corner of the TV? You can't stop the transmission and resend the lost packet. It's too late. This is where UDP comes into play. Where TCP is the I know it got there. UDP is the I hope it got there. UDP is sent without the three-way handshake like a broadcast. In addition to TCP and UDP, the transport layer also manages application separation, which determines what ports communicate with what applications. To be precise, there are 65,536 ports available, which are split into three categories. Ports 0 through 1023 are considered to be well-known ports. You cannot change these or use these for your own applications other than what they are intended for. They are sacred and considered to be set in stone. Ports 1024 through to 49151 are registered for specific applications. And finally ports 49152 through to 65535 are dynamic ports which can be used for your applications. Here's a list of the really well-known ports which should be committed to memory, especially if you are pursuing a career in computer networks. But not only do we need to know which port to send the data to, the return in traffic also needs to know which window to set the reply to. For example, if you have Firefox running with multiple tabs open, you want the data to be returned to the correct tab. This is done with TCP session ports not to be confused with the session layer. When I open up Internet Explorer or Firefox, 
These source ports are dynamically generated. You'll notice that Windows very kindly makes it user friendly. Instead of saying port 443 or 80, it says port HTTPS. But what we're interested in is the session port. After my IP address, there's the session port. You can find this information just by typing netstat in the command window. This command may very well be different for non-window operating systems. You'll need to consult with Google on that I'm afraid. Let's move down to the network layer. The network layer is responsible for the logical addressing. Today everything is now IP, but it wasn't always like that. For those who can remember the games like Doom, Quake or Wolfenstein, these games used IPX SPX and it was so easy to set up and the same for NetBuoy or Apple Talk. but these have all since been deprecated and IP is now ruling the world now let's bring back our diagram when we're talking about logical addressing we mean IP addresses we have our IP address and we have the website IP address now when you type in the website IP address the computer does not instinctively know how to get to the website it needs to find a route. This brings us down to the data link layer. This bit causes a lot of confusion with addressing as you're about to see. Let's jump back to our diagram. We've already established that at the network layer we say that using the logical address is the final destination of where we want our data to go. Let's say we want to buy a book from Amazon for £57. So £57 is the data payload and the destination IP address is this. The trouble is we don't know how to get there yet. We know the web server is not on our local network so we need to go to our default gateway which is the router. He will be able to point us in the right direction. Here's the confusion. There are two types of addresses. The first type of address is the physical address, which is called the media access control, but it's usually referred to as the MAC address. It's worth noting that different companies display them differently. For example, Microsoft display a MAC address like this, whereas Cisco will display the same MAC address like this. It's exactly the same, it's just displayed different. These MAC addresses are for the network interface of every network device on the local area network. The same as the place where you live has a unique name or number to your road or street. Likewise, each network interface on every network device should have a unique MAC address, which was hard coded into its chipset when manufactured. The second type of address which we've already covered in the network layer is the logical address or the IP address which is for the entire journey end to end and does not change. We refer to these as source IP and destination IP. Now both addresses play the part as the source IP and both play the part of the destination IP depending on which way the traffic is going. Think of yourself as the packet going along this journey. At this point you have the MAC address of the PC as your source MAC address because it's the address you are leaving. The waypoint in front of you, which is router 1, is your destination MAC address because it's the address you are heading towards. But when you, as the packet, pass through router 1, the MAC address information is replaced with new data. The MAC address of router 1, which you are now leaving, becomes the new source MAC address. And because you are now heading towards router 2, this becomes the new destination MAC address. And the process is repeated at every router along the way. As you pass through router 2, the MAC address information is replaced. Router 2 becomes the source MAC address. And finally, the web server becomes the destination MAC address. And then you've got the return journey. Let me explain in more detail. Now we want to send £57 reliably to our web server. So the £57 is the payload. The reliability is TCP. The destination port is 443. 
which is HTTPS. It has a dynamically assigned source port. We have our IP address and the destination IP address. We have the source MAC address of the PC and finally we have the destination MAC address of router 1. Now all this information is encapsulated into a packet and sent. Oh, while I remember, let's just bring back our OSI model. When the data is at the transport layer, it's called a segment. When the data gets to the network layer, it's called a packet. And at the data link layer, it's called a frame. And finally, when it gets to the physical layer, it's called bits. But these days, everybody just calls it a packet. So back to the packet. As I said, all this information is encapsulated into a packet and sent. Once it gets to the first router, the packet is analysed. And a router is designed to block local traffic. So in this case, it's the source and destination MAC addresses. So those are stripped from the packet. The exiting interface of the router becomes the new source MAC address. And the destination MAC address is the next router. The packet is then encapsulated again and passed on to the next router. Once again, it's inspected. And any local traffic is stripped from the packet. Same as before, the MAC addresses are replaced. The packet is then encapsulated and sent to the switch for delivery to the web server because it now knows that it's on the same network. After passing the packet up through the OSI layers, the data is delivered. Now we're down to the physical layer, which is the network card and the network cables. I hope this has been informative and thank you for watching. If you like this tutorial, give us a thumbs up and subscribe.